on the vlog again. Just can't wait to do a vlog again. The life I love is making vlogs for my friends. And I can't wait to do a vlog again. Doing a vlog again. Going places that I've never been. Seeing things that I may never see again. And I can't wait to do a vlog again. Hello everyone and welcome back to the Top Vloggers. As always, I am High and Mighty Joe hanging out with the lovely cat. And Aaron's in the back. We have got a great vlog for you today. We are headed to the Eugene V. Debs house. Uh, he was a social activist and uh, he was a big inspiring part of the union. And uh, we're going to learn a lot more about him today. So stay tuned. But we'll see two and a half stories of the house, and if you hang in there for the attic, it is, I promise, the best part of the entire museum. It's full of these gorgeous murals that kind of go chronologically through Deb's life. It's a great way to cap everything off. So, if wow. you like art, it's also a really good way to just appreciate a new way of looking at Deb's. So, As everyone knows who definitely watches my channel, I am a mural fanatic. Uh, then you are in the right spot. Uh, I love yeah. murals. I so we've been over the basics. Union leader, founded the American Railway Union, also led the Pullman strike, which convinced Debs that both Republicans and Democrats were in the pockets of big businesses. So that's what kind of convinced Debs to, to get on board with the Socialist Party. He co-founded the Socialist Party and then ran for president five times. But he was born and raised here in Terre Haute, lived in the city his entire life, and he and his wife Kate married in 1885 built the house five years later, 1890. So that's our year here. But you'll notice that we're not doing like the strictest period interpretation. Let's do the strictest period interpretation. Like you can see the iPad and the wireless router a little bit later. And that's okay because I'm not asking you to step back in time on this tour. Uh, kind of a different from other house museums, but we're more trying to think about maybe why Debs and his ideas can still matter in 2019 and, and beyond. I like to say he never stopped being relevant in some ways too. So uh, Jean and Kate stayed in the house for the rest of their lives. He dies in 1926, Kate 10 years later. Then this is a family home to a history professor. And then through the 1950s, it was a fraternity house, believe it or not. Um, Theta Chi lived in here for over a decade, Theta Chi ISU. And it's hard to comment on how preservation minded those guys might have been, but so much original uh, finishes have, have survived between the woodwork on the mantles, the pocket doors, the staircase, two examples of original leaded stained glass. One is over the gift shop, the other one is here in the parlor behind me. So maybe those guys had some clue, you know, of how important this house was. But then in the early 60s, uh, a contractor bought the house and split it up into apartments. And that involved dropping the ceilings, covering the wood floors with tile, painting a lot of the exposed woodwork, really changing the floor plan look and feel of the house. And at that point, it's pretty likely that ISU would have acquired the property and flattened it to make room for the expanding campus. We just guessed that because that's what happened to all the other houses that used to line the street. So the Debs Foundation chartered in 1962 to save this house um, as a memorial to Eugene and his brother Theodore Debs. They bought it that year, opened the museum after a few years of renovations in 65, and we were designated a National Historic Landmark by the Department of the Interior in 66. And this remains the only National Historic Landmark in all of Vigo County. So that is kind of our highest designation. And as you know, it ensures that we'll be here as long as we want. So now this has been a house museum for longer than it was actually the Debs residence, which I think is an accomplishment on its own. So while we're in here, this is actually all original to the home. And you can compare up to this photograph. You already noticed up here, Jean, Kate, and their nephew, Howard, sitting in all the same pieces that are here today. And these didn't come back to the house until like the 80s or 90s, so we didn't have to worry about all those different residents <laughs> living in the home. But we will use the tour to go through some different points in Jean's life story, starting here with his parents. They were French immigrants from Alsace, and they came over to the States in the late 1840s, first lived in Brooklyn for a while, then Cincinnati, and wound up settling here in Terre Haute, where they fit in with the large French and German-speaking community, community that already lived here. Now, normally, to back it up, we might think of European immigrants in the middle of the 1800s as coming over to the U.S. for one big thing. It's usually like land or jobs, economic opportunity, but the family stories, if they're true, tell us something that kind of bucks all those different trends. 
Apparently they move for love because back in France, Daniel, Jean's father, would have been okay, economically speaking. They owned a business, his family owned a business. It was either a textile mill or a charcuterie. We have some conflicting evidence about what kind of business it was, but regardless, Jean's mother, Daisy, worked for the Debs family. She was from a working class family. She was also Catholic. The Debs were French Protestants. And the Debs family looked down on this working class girl, didn't approve of their son's approval to marry her. So that's actually why they came over to America, to get married and start their own family here. They wound up settling in that little house on 4th Street, which is basically directly opposite ISU's campus from where we are. Um, today, Jean was born in that little house in 1855, just a couple of months after his parents had actually opened a grocery store out of their front room. Could you imagine running a little grocery store out of like? And that house room? is still yeah. there. It's not still there, unfortunately. It's not still there. There is a marker on Fourth Street designating where that house once stood and the birthplace of Eugene V. Debs. I can point you in that direction if you like, but it is on North Fourth Street on ISU's campus. Um, now, there's a reason they also had to run that shop out of their front room. Again, back in France, Daniel's family had the resources to educate him, and he studied literature. That's all well and good, but there aren't a lot of jobs studying literature in Terre Haute. This is an agricultural economy. So he finds work laying railroad ties, processing pork, but that type of manual labor broke uh, his health, and he couldn't keep it up, as it did for so many other workers at the time. So at one point, Daisy takes the last $40 $40 of the family's savings and goes over to the Holman Wholesale Grocery, who are the very same Holmans that people in Indiana might know and love today, and uh, use those dry goods to open a grocery store out of, the, out of her own front room. Now that's a, like a four-room shack, to be generous here, and a family of five and growing gives up their largest living space to run this little business. Quite a sacrifice, but that's how they had to survive and feed the children. Within about five years, that store was going so well that the family had relocated to a new home and store on what's now Wabash Avenue, was Main Street at the time. So we'll see that a little bit later in the tour. I want you to know Eugene had four sisters, Eugenie and Louise, Emma and Marie, and then a younger brother, Theodore Debs, in the middle of the back row there. Now, Theodore was Eugene's younger brother by 10 years his personal secretary, his campaign manager, closest friend, made an awful lot of Eugene's union and political work possible. So I like to say if you appreciate Jean's legacy, you owe some of that to Theodore. And then there's one more person that I want you to know. This is Marguerite Debs Cooper, Eugene's niece, Theodore's daughter. Jean and Kate never had children, and that will matter later in the tour. So Marguerite was kind of the favored niece, went on to help save the house as a charter member of the foundation, donated a ton of the collection that we have on display today, and she endowed the Debs Fellowship at ISU, and that is for graduate history students studying labor history and or social movements. But now we are in the library, and if you know your Victorian homes, the parlor, the last room, was strictly for proper company. The library here was more like a living room for Eugene and Kate, where they could spend some downtime. And since we're in the library, we can talk books for a minute. There are a couple over here that belong to Debs or are signed from him. One of them is from St. Clair Lewis. And a few more upstairs I'll point out. But we're mostly looking at donated books that give you an idea of what Eugene might read in more recent decades. And Gene's actual library, if you're interested, is housed along with thousands of his letters and papers over in the Debs collection at ISU in Cunningham Memorial Library. So the Special Collections Department, which includes the Debs collection, is a fantastic research archive for any historian interested in Debs or the time period. I honestly can't talk it up enough. Um, now, another resource. piece we want to talk about, uh, we've already found, it's a really, really cool table here in this room. And I want to be clear that this was never actually in the house and didn't belong to Eugene during his lifetime. But this was made by hand by one of his fellow inmates in the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary while Gene was serving his sedition sentence that we're just about to talk about. But I, I like this piece. You know, we could call it marquetry or inlaid. I don't, it doesn't matter to me what you call it. I just think it's a fantastic piece. It's, it's very beautiful. It really is. And you know, the over 4,000 little pieces of wood went into making this gorgeous table from seven different kinds of trees. And I think it goes a long way in showing us this idea that Debs had. You know, that just because a person is incarcerated, is behind bars, doesn't have to mean that they're a degenerate with nothing meaningful to offer society, but maybe is more indicative of their position in this bigger economic system, capitalism. And the way Debs saw it, 
If we're going to run an economy that is built to accumulate resources at the top to enrich just a few, you know, it's in the name, capitalism, then that's going to spell poverty for some portion of the population. In Dev's words, poverty breeds the misery that leads to crime. We also know that not all crime is caused by poverty, but Debs described this larger criminal justice system as one that is designed to catch the minnows, the little fish, while letting the whales go free. Now you were asking them about these buttons over here. Now these are called pocket doors, and they're kind of hiding inside the walls right now. But if, do you want to push this little button right here, really, really slow, and then that handle, and, then you yeah, we've got, and we don't want to open it all the way because we've got the rug down here. But just a little bit, you can see how these would open all the way up, and then you can close and off the these rooms. Yeah, and then the nice little, that actually has a lock on it, so you could lock these doors if you really wanted to. We don't open them all the way or and lock them. It would yeah, be it would pretty. be nice to be able to have something like that in your house where it you really could, could you know, close yeah. off a room or, or whatever. Yeah, like a nice convertible floor plan. And that would give you some privacy if you're meeting with friends, for example. It could help keep one room warm if it was really cold in the winter and you had a fireplace lit. So the original open floor plan, yeah, exactly. I guess, you know? Yeah, precisely. It's a really good way of putting it. It may not like look all that special, but I think this is one of the most important works of art featuring Debs because he sat for the first carving of this in between sessions of his sedition trial in 1918. So, uh, so 102 years ago, this past spring, April of 1917, the U.S. Congress approves a very important declaration of war to end all wars and make the world safe for democracy. And I like to say that I'll just let you decide if that was the case or if it ended up working out that way. But regardless, President Wilson had just campaigned for his re-election on the fact that he kept us out of this mounting war in his first term. That tells us amongst the voters this might not be the most popular idea. And that's why uh, President Wilson goes on to launch a propaganda campaign. The Creed Committee, I Want You, signs the Selective Service Act, which passed a really controversial draft and then signs the sedition and espionage laws. And those two policies made it a crime to criticize the war or the US government. Two things the socialists were already doing, by the way. And generally speaking, socialists are anti-war because they share this idea that workers of all countries should be united on the same side, not pitted against each other by the ruling classes of their respective nations. But by 1918, even after the Socialist Party, at Dev's direction, had taken an explicitly anti-war position, some socialists would endorse the war effort. And I think some of them really genuinely thought that stopping the Prussians was the right thing to do, but we can't forget that other radicals were facing prison sentences of 10, 20 years, deportation, loss of citizenship if they were immigrants, entire newspapers were shut down for publishing anti-war pieces. We could say that these policies were designed to chill free speech. And that's why we might understand why some socialists would tone it down a little bit or even change their minds. But if you know the first thing about this guy, Gene Debs, he's the figurehead of this movement and he's not going to cave on his deeply held principles. Goes on to give his most famous speech 101 years ago last Sunday, actually June 16, 1918. And he's speaking to about 1,200 socialists at a park in Canton, Ohio. So we call it the Canton speech and a handful of federal agents peppered throughout that crowd, recording every subversive word of Deb's speech and asking to see the draft cards of the young men in the crowd as well. And Deb says, it's the wealthy who always declare the wars, the workers who always fight the battles. He says, you who have your lives to lose, you above all others have the right to decide this momentous issue of war or peace. If war is really right, let it be declared by the people. And all of this is considered practically treason, sedition to be specific, but close enough. He is indicted by a federal grand jury in Cleveland on 10 counts of sedition, arrested, tried, convicted, and sentenced to 10 years in prison for giving a speech. This is where we might back up and go like, isn't there an amendment in our constitution protecting speech like this? But here is one of the first times that the courts will dig into the weeds of what free speech really means in a practical sense. And where you first hear the argument in a case right before Debs, a very similar case, that you cannot yell fire in a crowded theater if there's no fire. You know, that speech can hurt someone. We all know the example. Now that same logic applies to Debs in this case. 
hear me uh, yelling fire and hurting someone is uh, basically Debs encouraging young men to not register for the draft, which Debs did not explicitly say at any point, but his sentiments were considered enough. So the Supreme Court denied his appeal, upheld his conviction. He goes to prison in West Virginia, transfers to Atlanta, where he famously runs for president, a one-fifth and final time from his prison cell, and gets almost a million votes, three and a half percent of the popular vote in 1920, without ever leaving the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary. So he's released on Christmas Day, 1921, when President Harding grants a presidential commutation of his sentence to time served, which was not a pardon. Debs wouldn't accept a pardon anyway, but he's released has breakfast with the warden's family. The warden's son will go on to help save this house as another charter member of the foundation. And then as a condition of Eugene's release, he had to go to Washington, D.C. because the president wanted to meet the man that he'd heard so damn much about. So they have a conversation. Not much is written about what they said. Eugene came back to Terre Haute. And the New York Times reported that a crowd of 50,000 supporters greeted him at the train station just a few blocks away and escorted him back to the house. House. Now, 50,000 was well more than popu the, the Terre Haute's population at the time, and today it's 60,000. But that's just the scope and the scale of this admiration for Debs. He was functionally considered a martyr for his cause by this point, and never recovered from the toll that prison took on his physical health. Died about five years after his release, after having a heart attack in 1926 at the age of 70. But back to the bust, which is our topic of conversation here. There is another casting of that out in the National Portrait Gallery in DC. So if you're out that way, please keep an eye out for him. And another side note is that the artist, Louis Mayer, was kind of a notable sculptor for the time. And there, uh, he was yet another charter member of the foundation. It really was a collective effort to save this house, more than any one or two people could have ever done. Uh, so that wraps up the library. But we're looking at more original furniture. This is the complete mahogany dining suite owned by Jean and Kate. Uh, if not every visitor these days cares too much about antique china, I'm not going to lie, but you might. We do have Kate's complete set of Haviland china over here, which you might know is French and kind of pricey. That was a wedding gift to Kate, and I, maybe you've been keeping track, but we've actually seen five, four fireplaces so far on your tour. So there was one hiding out in the foyer behind my office, there's one in the parlor, one in the library, and now number four is right here in the dining room. And this one in particular is made with this gorgeous porcelain cobalt blue tile. And I personally would love to have like a pool or a hot tub made out of tile like this. But one journalist who visited the house to interview Debs saw this fireplace and described it in his article as the mark of an aristocrat. And critics of Debs would expand on that, saying, how can Eugene V. Debs claim to speak for the workers if these are his digs, if this is what he comes home to? And I can certainly see like where those critics are coming from. At the same time, this house is not a mansion. And if you like to visit house museums, you know that this home wouldn't begin to compare to actual mansions built by the extremely wealthy of the same time period. And the quintessential example of that might be the Biltmore. Have you been out to the Biltmore in North Carolina? It's like, it's in the mountains and it's the Vanderbilt estate. And it's, it's just, I mean, it's, it's a gorgeous like place, but um, and built in the same time period with a lot. And it's, you know, nicknamed America's biggest house and built in the same time period as this one with a lot of the same tastes in mind. But Debs, you know, might, guessing here, but might look at something like the Biltmore and say, here's an ostentatious display of wealth. And for a family of three, by the way. But Jean and the rest of the movement that he led were fighting for every worker, every regular person to at least have a decent home. And honestly, I'll say some of the nicer things in life, too. It goes back to this very, very old idea in the labor movement of bread and roses. There's a song, I promise I won't sing for you today. But it's this idea, hearts can starve as well as bodies. We're human beings. None of us should be scraping by on the bare minimum. Let's live our lives with some comfort and dignity. We want bread. We want roses, too. It's really that simple. Another labor organizer, Big Bill Haywood, even more simply put it, nothing is too good for the workers. So I think that's a good way of putting it, too. And I would ramble about this issue for a long time. But while we're talking about the house, I do want to point out that this is how it looked when Theta Chi was around. So a little different from how it appears today, the fraternity put on the cedar shingle siding here. In the 1960s, the Debs Foundation put on the white vinyl that's still on the house. I'm not very partial to either of them, but I'm happy to say we are in the planning stages 
of a really huge renovation and restoration to something like the original slate gray cedar bevel lap siding that used to cover the home with some red. This model doesn't show all the red accents and polychromy that we would see on the house as well. So it's, it's going to be an exciting time as we move forward with these renovations. It'll be a few years out yet still before we're making large progress, but we're still pretty thrilled for that. So unfortunately, we don't have anything original to the kitchen back here. It kind of bums me out. I guess nobody thought these domestic items were worth saving, but I'll do you one better. Instead, almost everything in this room is from Jean's early life and childhood here in Terre Haute. So these table and chairs are from that tiny house on 4th Street that we saw back in the parlor. This looks like a French flag. It's actually a very long banner that Eugene's parents brought when they immigrated from France which makes that at least 170 some odd years old by now, if not even older. Wow. Yeah, and it's held its color really well. I'm impressed every time I see it. Now this is the house in store once the family relocated to their Wabash Avenue location, or what's now Wabash Woods Main Street. Again, the family lived in the back, the store is up front, there's an office on the second floor up front, and then Gene and his little brother Theodore slept in the attic over the office. The, what, you, what you can see is now Wabash Ave was a dirt road when this photo was taken. This is also at the northeast corner of 11th and Wabash. Today that's where Jimmy John's is, if you're driving around downtown you'll notice. Now the counter on this wall is from the grocery store. Most of the items on and around it are from the house and store. So Jean's mother's cast iron cookware, which is back in style again, yay. Their coffee mill, candy jars from the shop. Last thing I'll point out are these casts on the floor. They kind of have a good story. The devs had to compete with about 400 other little grocery stores around Terre Haute at the time. You know, pre-Kroger, pre-Walmart, uh, there's a shop like this on basically every street. So. Uh, they have to compete, and to do so, they imported French Bordeaux and Clary wines. That's what the casts on the floor here held. And other French immigrants living in Terre Haute supported the shop by buying those imports. Eugene spent his childhood working in the shop, helping out his parents, going to the old seminary school, and then the public school when it gets more secure funding after the Civil War, and reading in all of his free time. Uh, you might remember that his father had studied literature back in France and raises his two sons to read in all of their spare time. It was probably one of their biggest hobbies. Eugene's favorite book from a very young age happened to be Les Mis. So we might know the story of Jean Valjean, who stole a loaf of bread to feed his sister's starving children, winds up in prison for 19 years. And that's just the exposition, <laughs> you know, and it's these, these themes of poverty and injustice and inequality would have had, I think, an outsized impact on the social conscience of this boy growing up here in Terre Haute. Which kind of, if you think about it, is about almost the exact same thing as a man giving a speech mm -hmm. and then being arrested mm -hmm. for his words. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. it's, it's almost the same thing as... Yeah. Yeah, I can see the parallels there. You know what I mean? Sure. Yeah. He's like, I, I stole a loaf of bread, but I did it to save people's lives. Yeah. He's like, I'm, I, I, I'm saying these words to improve people's lives, and yet you're going to imprison me for them. Exactly, yes. So, and so it's just like the 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 way that, the, I guess the way Deb saw it at least, is that the justice system does not necessarily enact justice the way we might understand it. So that's meh. Yeah. So when Jean's 14 years old, tides change a little bit. The family shop lost money in the unstable economy after the Civil War, and the family had grown to include the six kids total. As the eldest son, Jean felt that he had an obligation or a duty to start working for wages outside of the home to contribute to the family's income. And that was a very important sign of masculinity that really mattered to Jean his entire life. But he drops out against his parents' wishes, drops out of high school, and gets a job working as a painter for the Terre Haute and Indianapolis Railroad. So here's Gene over here. He's on the far left, so maybe foreshadowing his much later politics. And his job as a painter is painting train cars with lead paint and then scraping the paint off when it starts to peel and flake away. So now we get how dirty and dangerous that is. But Gene did at least put his skills to good use. You know, he learns how to do lettering and actually painted this sign and would paint signs like this one as favors for his friends and neighbors. So even at a young age, he starts to get this reputation for being so kind-hearted and generous. And you might know that stays with him his entire life, especially later on. There are countless accounts of folks who didn't always agree with Des politics, but could almost universally acknowledge his profound spirit of generosity that does date back 
to his boyhood and his adolescence. But after doing this work for about a year, as we say, he moves on up to work as a locomotive fireman. So he's not putting out fires, he's shoveling coal on steam engines, and that's your typical pre-OSHA, incredibly dangerous railway job. There are no rules to speak of keeping workers like Jean in one piece, and employers, not to be mean here, but they had this bad habit of skimping on cheap equipment to save money. That would cause, that would fail, causing boiler explosions, derailments, collisions, not uncommon for workers like Jean to lose lives or limbs just for showing up to work that day in preventable accidents. And it was after witnessing deaths of his fellow workers that Eugene joined his first labor union. We might say the rest is history. But he was 19 years old. He signs up to be a charter member of the Vigo Lodge of the Brotherhood of Locomotive Firemen. So it's kind of long-winded. And this document is not in the best shape, but it's kind of cool. This is the charter that established the Vigo Lodge of the BLF, the first union Gene ever joined. Here's his name. Eugene Debs, as a charter member, that's not his signature because this would be filled out by the Green Secretary at the bottom left corner. But you might know, within a few years, Gene found out he was a really skilled organizer, knew how to show up in the bars and taverns where railroaders would hang out, got them to join their unions, exploded the number of members and lodges that the BLF had around the nation, and even got the union out of debt very, very quickly. So he finds himself appointed to the position of its grand secretary. It's basically its national secretary. So there's another charter of a BLF local up here in this corner. This one's from Fort Wayne, which is near my hometown. And here is Jean's real signature. He would have filled out that document as the grand secretary. So I like to use these two charters to show his like progression through the organization. But it's worth stepping back and talking about what the BLF actually did. Normally, we think of labor unions as engaging in collective bargaining to get a fair contract. The BLF did, had a different priority, actually. Every member paid 50 cents monthly dues. That's life insurance. If a worker is killed on the job, his family is going to get a check for maybe 1500 bucks to cover some lost wages and some funeral expenses. And I like to make sure we're aware that that money is not coming from the employer who turned a buck off the work that took someone's life. It's coming from his fellow workers, struggling in theory just as much as he might have been. Just a glimpse into how dire the priorities really had to be for these organizers at the time. Um, they weren't as much focused on trying to bargain for a raise as much as make sure their kids will be cared for if they don't make it home from work that day because there was no guarantee. That's just how much risk this type of work held. Uh, but on a much happier, lighter note, we do have Jean's high chair down here, and all of his siblings also use this when they grew up in Terre Haute. I love this because it is so humanizing. I have met folks who have literally traveled across the country just to see this house and be in the space. And a lot of them, I'm not going to lie, myself included, we can hold up Debs as this towering folk hero from history. And that's not all wrong, because he was six foot four. He kind of was towering, and he was considered a full hero by workers. That's not an exaggeration. But he was also a baby and a high school dropout, and just as human and complex as all the rest of us. I don't think any museum should be engaged in hero worshiping. That's not our business here. We're trying to look at Debs as a nuanced person like the rest of us. A small sampling of the Debs Awards, and you might know every year the Debs Foundation presents an award to someone keeping the legacy alive in fields of labor rights, social justice, and world peace. So you might recognize some names up here like Pete Seeger, Dorothy Day, Jesse Jackson, A. Philip Randolph, Walter Ruther, a lot of different labor leaders, and there are dozens more not on this wall. A couple of my favorites would include Coretta Scott King, Dolores Huerta, and Cesar Chavez, organized farm workers. Howard Zinn wrote a really important book called A People's History of the United States. That's the homework that I like to give to folks who want to know more about this side of history. And then my very favorite recipient of all time happens to be another Hoosier hero of ours, Kurt Vonnegut, um, got the award back in 1981. More recently, the award has gone to Jobs with Justice, the national organization. Um, Bill Lucy, who's a retired uh, AFSCME secretary, but is maybe more known for organizing the Memphis Sanitation Workers Strike 50 years ago. And then uh, this upcoming Debs Award is going to Mary Kay Henry. She is the sitting president of SEIU, Service Employees International Union, and is, I think we consider her the brains behind the fight for 15. So it's going to be pretty 
um, exciting to have her here in Terre Haute. September 28th is the date of that banquet. If you need a reason to come back to Terre Haute, it's going to be a good time. From an interesting place, the Rand School of Social Science. And that was a socialist college founded in Manhattan around 1905 by a Christian socialist minister, kind of with the intention of turning out more working class leaders like Debs. That's why the auditorium was dedicated to him. It taught courses on things like economics, history, public speaking. That was a co-ed and integrated school, so students of all races, nationalities, genders get to study together. Um, and it, at its peak during World War I, had about 4,000 enrolled students. John L. Lewis, President of the United Mine Workers of America, founder of the CIO, later merged that with the AFL. Uh, so we all know the AFL CIO. Half of that is thanks to him. Uh, also got the inaugural Debs Award back in 1965, and maybe should get an award for the best eyebrows in the whole labor movement too. That's just my opinion, though. No? And uh, I like that Lewis is here because he gives us a chance to talk about this really important shift in Debs thinking to industrial unionism, organizing all workers within a particular industry into one union, regardless of their actual job that they're doing, different ways of organizing workers. Now, when Debs was with the Brotherhood of Locomotive Firemen, that was a craft brotherhood. And just on the railroads, there were about a dozen separate organizations that different crafts could join. So the brakemen, the switchmen, the, the engineers, the firemen, for example, all had a different organization that they could join. And now that'll get you so far with things like mutual aid and maybe some collective bargaining. But here we are, end of the 1800s. Debs looked at the railroads and sees our most powerful employers, our first corporations, figuring out consolidation of power, figuring out automation to cut back on jobs, and then figuring out how to, in some cases, lethally defeat craft union strikes by pitting craft workers against each other. Debs thought if railroad workers didn't want to starve in the next coming century, they'd have to find a stronger, more unified way of organizing themselves. So he envisioned the first industrial union in the nation, the American Railway Union. But first, he tried to kind of merge the dozen brotherhoods into one organization. His members kind of resisted. So 1893, after building the Brotherhood of Locomotive Firemen, for 20, almost 20 years, Eugene resigned from his position and founded the American Railway Union, a brand new type of union that said it would organize all railroad workers regardless of their job or their skill level. Now, as important as this change was, it wasn't as inclusive as it professed to be because you had to be white to be a member of the American Railway Union. And that was a pretty common failing of labor unions at the time. Uh, and Debs actually did oppose that exclusionist policy and tried to get it changed. He brought an amendment to a uh, convention of the American Railway Union uh, and uh, it would have basically changed the constitution to allow black workers into the ARU. The membership or the delegates at that convention voted 110 to 112 not to organize black workers. That's how contentious of an issue this was just within this one union. And Debs would later reflect that perhaps if the ARU had organized, for example, the Black Pullman Porters, that the Pullman strike could have turned out quite a bit differently. It's hard to say in hindsight, but I think it's a significant thing to point out. And the ARU did lead two very important events. The first was the Great Northern Railway Strike of 94. All you need to know is that's a massive success, fought over wage cuts for already the poorest paid unskilled workers on the Great Northern Railroad. The ARU takes on the Great James Hill, he refuses to arbitrate, so the ARU shuts it down. They are not moving any trains across the Great Northern Railroad. And this is really the first time that we ever saw engineers and engine wipers, skilled and unskilled workers, striking at the same time, all in solidarity for, again, the lowest paid workers on the scale. And they won. They got wages reinstated. And as a result, tens of thousands of railroaders flock to this new union looking for the same kinds of successes in their own workplaces and on their own jobs. And that sets the stage quite nicely for the Pullman strike, our next topic. Uh, and at the time of the Pullman strike, the ARU actually had 150,000 members in 27 states. And that made it the biggest union in the country and larger than all those little rubber brotherhoods put together. So it's looking like it's going to change the trajectory of how unions actually worked at the time. And then we get to the Pullman strike. Is that First of all, we know George Pullman had perfected the Pullman Palace sleeping train car 
for long distance overnight luxury travel, usually used by the wealthier upper middle class, and it just, I mean, it transformed rail travel at the time. But all of those train cars were built in Pullman, Illinois, uh, on the south side of Chicago today, and uh, Pullman is an original name for a company town. Factory workers building those train cars had to rent their homes from the company store, buy their groceries, sorry, rent their homes from the company, buy their groceries from stores that had contracts with the Pullman company, send their kids to company schools. It was kind of weird how the social control in Pullman could extend. And George Pullman had justified this experiment of a model community saying, here's a shot at what he called benevolent capitalism. We'll have nice paved streets, brick homes, trash collection, it'll be a great clean orderly way to live. We might also see, however, that if your whole paycheck is going back to the company at the end of the week, it might be a little worse off in the long run. Also, there's a discussion about the issue of democracy in Pullman, whether or not workers could elect city leaders or if they just have a company making decisions for everybody living in the community. So then we get... It, so it sounds more like it's a company making the decisions for everyone else in the community. Mm -hmm. I don't think they had the, as you said, the right to be, you know, vote their... Their lead, to vote their leaders in and yeah, yeah. It, vote them out again, I right, guess, when the time right. might come. So. Yeah, exactly. And this is like where it comes down to, we, this isn't normally part of the tour, but this is where we can really dig into these huge, huge, broad sweeping questions about the nature of democracy in a for-profit economy. We don't elect people like Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos to have the disproportionate kind of control over the economy that they do wield. Nobody ever voted for them, you know? Um, and yet, look at how much of our lives they have some sway over, you know? And, and that's taking it up into like contemporary terms, but Debs is looking at people like George Pullman and saying, none of us ever voted for this guy to, to basically decide how we travel across the country to, you know? So it's just questions like that that start to make Debs wonder a little bit about maybe things not working out so well in the system that existed in his life. So, but these are questions that he's starting to grapple with as this is all coming. Remember, he's not a socialist yet, and he's just barely radical. We're just getting to this point, and this is a transformational time in his life because of these questions and because of, of the situation that he saw in Pullman specifically. But now, back on the script here or whatever, there's a recession or a panic of 1893. Bottoms out the economy, one of the worst recessions we've seen. And in order to not cut shareholders' dividend payouts or cut executive salaries, Pullman cut pay for factory workers by about a third across the board, in some cases by over half, without cutting rents. And that's where we get a really familiar squish between these low wages and these high rents, and not a lot of wiggle room in the middle, which sounds really familiar to folks in 2019 as well. But uh, Pullman, he's, he's insisting that, you know, he doesn't, he's, he's in the landlord business now, or whatever, real estate, and other landlords didn't adjust their rents based on the income of their tenants, so why should he, even though he's setting the income of tenants? But uh, the factory workers, in some cases, are fainting on the job because they hadn't eaten in days, because they couldn't afford to, based on how tightly strapped they were. So they bring a grievance committee to the company to list out some issues about poor pay, high rents, and then abuses in the factories by four They get assurance that no one will be retaliated against for bringing these issues to the company. The next day, reporting for work, three of them are fired. This triggers a walkout. About, I don't know, three or 4,000 factory workers in Pullman lay down their tools, walk out of the shops, and say, Pullman, we can't go back to work until you reinstate our wages, cut our rents so that we can afford to live. Now, Pullman insists that there is nothing to arbitrate. He thinks he doesn't have any obligation to come and bargain or arbitrate with, with these workers. So the factory workers go to the ARU with Debs at its head and ask them to support their strike with the secondary boycott of any train moving Pullman cars across the country. And that's a big ask because Pullman cars are just about everywhere. And like we said, Debs is not particularly radical just yet. He's still skeptical about direct action, very, very cautious about strikes, thinks that we can solve these problems on the job by bargaining in good faith with our employers. But therein lies a missing ingredient, good faith in the employer. Pullman still won't meet with anyone representing the factory workers. So Debs goes to visit the community, sees what's going on, met one worker who after his rent came out of his check, had $2 for two weeks of work and eight children to feed. That's when I think he realized he had a moral imperative to stand in solidarity with the strikers in Pullman. 
Long story short here, one local at a time, the ARU members across the country endorsed the boycott. They stopped the rails from Detroit to the West Coast. We really hadn't seen something on this scale happening from organized railroad workers up until this point. Um, and then we get... Well, that you yeah. got to think that is just ridiculous. I mean, $2. Yeah. Uh, you know, two weeks worth of work, you know, eight kids. Like, it's unlivable. That's, uh, but this is also a I assume I assume that that's probably why most of the other people went ahead and agreed with Mr. Debs, whether they thought he was right yeah. or not. They thought, well, if this guy's not even going to come to the table and, yeah. and negotiate, mm -hmm. then we have no choice but yeah. to, you know, to stand behind the other people. Exactly. Like, it's just, exactly. And, like, what is most, like maybe striking, to use the term here, about this, is that almost every railroad worker who participated in the strike, it ended up being a quarter of a million, 250,000 railroaders participated in the Pullman strike. Almost none of them had ever met a worker in Pullman. You know, normally, if you might think of like solidarity and labor strikes, you're, you're thinking about the well-being of your co-workers, people in your own shop, in your own town, your own community. These are people in Sacramento you know, in Detroit or whatever, who had never been to Chicago, perhaps, but still felt that an injury to one is an injury to all. That's the entire ethos of any labor union, or at least it should be. But uh, that's maybe the most important lesson that we can take out of the Pullman strike is that even if it didn't end up the way that Debs and the Pullman workers had hoped and the ARU members had hoped, that we still got a, a show of just how much is, is capable by United Labor when we're united behind a common cause. But then uh, a federal court issues an injunction, which now we know federal courts become a theme in Jane's <laughs> life later on, issues an injunction against the ARU, saying, look, you can't strike like this, ARU. You're interfering with the males, which is a half-truth. Debs had urged strikers to not interfere with the mail, but some railroads insisted on attaching trains moving Pullman cars to mail, U trains moving U.S. mail. So we're napped in that way. And then says, uh, also, ARU, you're interfering with free trade across state lines. And if we remember our history, that's the Sherman Antitrust Act. And it's a pretty perverse, I would say, use of that policy because it's meant to help labor and break up the trust, huge businesses. And here we see it. Thank you so much for joining us on this vlog. Uh, we had a great time. Don't forget to come back next week for part two. It should be uh, just as exciting as this one, if not more exciting. Plus, we got the very top to come, which is where all the murals are. And you know how excited uh, murals make me uh, and how much I love those. And I know you guys love them as well. So don't forget to join us again next week for part two as well. You can join us on all of our social media websites, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at the Top Vloggers. Also, if you'd like to help us reach the top, you can do so by going to www.patreon.com backslash the top vloggers. Without your help and support, these vlogs would be almost impossible to do. And that's going to do it for us here today. Don't forget again to join us next week. If you're new here, hit that subscribe button. Take it one step further. Ring that notification bell. Smash that like button on this video. Give us a big thumbs up. Helps us more than you know. We'll see you again next week. Top vloggers.